Amen. Turn, if you have your Bibles tonight, to 1 Corinthians. We've been dealing with the gifts of the Spirit. Man, last Wednesday night we finished up on those gifts that, um, that say something to us, those utterance gifts. Y'all remember what they were? Uh, the utterance gifts, there's three of them. There was the uh, message in tongues and, and prophecy. Amen. Y'all are good. That's, that's, that's real good. Tonight we're going to start in on the revelation gifts, and the revelation gifts will always reveal something to us. They will reveal something. They include a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits. And I'll tell you, we need this in the body today more than we've ever needed it before. Would you shout a good amen to that? Tonight we're going to be dealing with a word of knowledge, and I want to remind you that if you're a spirit-filled child of God, you have the gifts residing in you, and you can be the minister of any of these gifts as God so desires. It is at his desire. Now, there was um, a fellow years ago came up to a friend of mine, I might have told you this because he, he was talking about speaking in tongues, and he told this man, this friend of mine, he said, I can speak in tongues when I want to. And uh, my buddy just got tired of hearing it because he said it to him every time he turned around. He finally one day when he said it to him, he said, well, this, speak me some, brother. And the old boy looked at him like he fell out of his tree, but he was, he was, he was taken back by it. And he found out real quick that he couldn't speak uh, by the gifts of the Spirit until the Holy Spirit moved on him to do so. And that's the way all of the gifts of the Spirit I've said this to you before. I'll remind you of it throughout this series, throughout this study, that it is not the gifts of the church. It's not the gifts of the pastor. It's not the gifts of the deacon board. It's the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. They go where he goes. Amen. Last count I had, we have good services because when we gather together, we gather together as Spirit-filled believers have Jesus in us, Brother Doug, and when we do that, whether we meet up at Walmart or out here in the church house, it doesn't make any difference because he's going to show up there. Amen. We just take him with us everywhere we go. Would you shout a good amen to that? I remember old Charles Johnson and the Revivers singing that old song, said, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. And I'm going to tell you something, if the body of Christ will get back to that understanding, we'd be a whole lot better off. Amen be a whole lot better off. So tonight let's look here in verses 4 through 11 again of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, if you're going to if you're going to study the gifts of the spirit, you're going to have to study 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14 because all three of them have to deal with the gifts of the spirit. Verse number 4, he says, "But now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit." I love this. There are diversities or differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, y'all remember we said it's not given to every man as we think of every man on the street, but he's given to every man who is a Spirit-filled believer, who is a Christian believer with Christ in the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Would you say a good amen to that? And uh, I'll tell you what, I, I got some more research material out about an hour or so before church, and I was just going to touch up some stuff, and I just had to close it, Brother Doug, because it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I said, oh, Lord, I don't have time to write this down, let alone, let alone bring it out. So uh, it, we're just skimming the surface of it to keep us reminded of who we are in Christ. He said there, said for his, uh, given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healings uh, by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of Spirit, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these works that one and the same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. I love that. And that terminology severally, again, uh, means as according to the need. I said this to you a lot. I, and and I, I, I repeat things because I want us to get it. And I'm not just saying you. I'm saying me. I want it to be reminded not just here but down here. 
when he says it as is needed, when he talks about several as will, uh, we had this young lady tonight that said that she's um, going for some tests to be run and she's got some problems with her brain. In other words, she needs a miracle of healing. So we don't need tongues for that, do we? We need a miracle of healing, okay? And so that's what he's talking about. Whatever the need is, these gifts are given to the body of Christ to meet that need. And any one of us at any given time can be moved on by the Spirit Amen. You may be at home tonight in your bed, sound asleep, and God wake you up midnight, bring this young lady's face and her name back to your mind and say, pray for her. And that may be the time when faith rises and touches the hem of his garment and she's forever healed. Amen. You, you see how important it is? And so this is what we want to look at. And so I, I believe that the people of God are, are tired of glory hogging preachers, don't y'all? I believe that. I, I, I believe that. I, and, and the saints who act like they're God's gift to the church, I, I believe they're tired of that. Now, when Paul wrote this, this to them, that's what was going on in the Corinthian church. The gifts were in operation of the church, but the motive behind the gifts was all wrong. It caused division in the body of Christ. And one of the things that that word manifestation there means uh, in, and throughout this, this, this um, study is it means a, um, a illumination. It means a bearer of light. And so what does that mean? It means that if we come in here and I bring a candle with me and Brother Bess has a candle but his candle's not lit, I can go and I can give him a gift of light. You get that? A gift of light. And when I give him a gift of light, he's going to have light, but my light is not going to be diminished by that at all. Oh, you see what I'm saying? He can turn around then and give Sister Best uh, the gift of light, and his light is not going to be diminished, but the knowledge is going to be increasing. You see what I'm saying? And so Paul was saying, you don't need to have this faction in the body of Christ and be jealous over somebody else's gift. And you don't need to be uh, lording it over, acting like you're all that in a box of Cracker Jacks too because you've got a gift that somebody else hasn't operated in and you think you're the only one that's got the gift to the church and you need to get over yourself and just realize that God is the one that's in charge and if we don't do it according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 out of love, then it don't amount to hill of beans anyway. Are y'all y'all with me? And so he was trying to deal with these factions that were going on in that local assembly. So we want to look at the word of knowledge uh, here tonight. Another thing is the Lord does not play with a person's emotions. I've told you that several times. If it is a true gift, God gives you this gift to operate and whatever gift it may be to operate in. Uh, and, and he says to you, you need to pray for pastor because pastor's got this going on. That. He gives you a word of knowledge, in other words. Then he's also going to give you the gift of faith to pray for that. You understand what I'm saying? Because he's not going to play with my emotions. Okay, so if you say to me, if you come up to me and you say to me, God, Brother Pat, God has told me that you need a prayer for such and such a need, then I expect you to either have the faith yourself to pray for me or have someone in tow to pray with you for me so that we can get the job done. Amen. Because, see, God's not going to play with my emotions. And I'll give you a case in point. I might have already given you this, but if I have, please bear with me. Have you ever seen somebody make a big issue about discerning a demon spirit in somebody? And I've seen preachers that stop the whole service, and they talk about what this person's got or that person's got, and then they pray a little 30-second prayer and pull them on through the prayer line uh, and, and they were just as problematic after they went through the prayer line. They had the same problem that they had before they ever went in there. And all it done is make him look good in the eyes of those that don't know any better. I'm sitting there as a pastor when I see this take place and I'm getting furious because I got to go back and deal with that family whenever they go back to church and their child is not any better or their loved one is not any better and I've got to be able to have an explanation that they're going to buy, for lack of better terminology, as to why they didn't have their needs met. Well, the bottom line is this. If God reveals to me that somebody has a spirit, if God reveals to me that somebody's sick in body and needs uh, to be healed, then I'm going to tell you something. I'm expecting God to heal. 
When I lay hands on them, I expect God to heal. Would you say amen to that? Because the reason is I don't want to play with your emotions, and I know God don't want to play with your emotions. Are you, are you seeing? So that's the importance for the gifts of the, of the Spirit to be in operation in the body. And so when you see something going on like I'm describing here tonight, it already infuriates you as a Pentecostal believer because there's too much foolishness going on and God's name's being attached to it when he's a thousand miles away from that mess. I'm just being honest with you tonight, church. I said this to you before, but you point to me any, in the last 50 years, any era of doctrine that you want to talk about, that you could bring up, and it originated out of full gospel rank and file. The old line churches, Brother uh, Doug, they still teaching and preaching. The old Methodists are still teaching and preaching. The old Presbyterian, the same thing they've been preaching and teaching for 100 years, and Baptists are doing the same thing, this, that, and the other. You see what I'm saying? But we... We got folks in the church that think us four in the Godhead. We got others that think us three in the Godhead. Then we got those that say there's only one in the Godhead. And you see what I'm saying? And it's because of we're trying to make God in our little box and in our image instead of us being made in the image of God. I told y'all there was a preaching spirit loose up in here tonight, and I, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Will you, will you, would you say amen? Now, he's never going to show a preacher something to show off the preacher's ability to speak a word to somebody. And anything that comes across that way is out of order. Let's look at the definition here tonight just for a moment. Talking about a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation of one bit. You might want to write that down in the margin of your Bibles. One bit of God's knowledge to the mind of the spirit-filled child of God. In other words, when we have a word of knowledge, it is just that, it is a word. God don't give us all of his knowledge about any given subject. Are y'all with me? Uh, that's like, now I called a roofer today to help us with some leaking problems down below. And uh, when I just told him, I said, we got some leaks down there. And uh, he's not going to set me down and tell me all the ins and outs of why we got leaks and how he's going to fix the leaks and what he's going to use to fix the leaks with. I don't care about none of that. All I want to know is I've got the leaks fixed. Would you say amen? That's all the knowledge I need to have. Are you seeing what I'm saying? It's the same way with God. We're praying about things in our life, and so God says, I'm going to give him a word of knowledge about this out of the other. He's going to, he'll answer your questions. He doesn't elaborate. You know what he said in the scripture? He told us to let your yay be yay and your nay nay. You know what he's saying there? Grandpa said it like this. He said, God gave you two ears, one mouth. That means he wants you to do twice as much listening as he does talking. <laughs> Ooh, some of us would be better off if we'd do that, wouldn't we? I think all of us would, wouldn't we? Am I, am I, am I the only one tonight got these fingers pointing back at me here? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Bates. I appreciate your honesty with me tonight. That's just the way we are. We're, we're human. We got a lot more Peter in us than we got of um, John. Would you say amen? Old John, he didn't care about nothing but just laying on the bosom of Christ, hearing the heartbeat of Christ, talking and fellowshipping with Jesus, listening to the teaching of Jesus. But what's Peter doing? Peter's running around there. He's floating around like his banny rooster, like he's somebody. You know, he's always talking out of turn. <laughs> You hear, everybody else may forsake you, Lord, but I'll die with you. And, and the Lord just looked at him, son, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny knowing me three times. And he did. I believe that's what we're talking about tonight, a word of knowledge old Peter got. Did he not? Okay. Straight from the man. Who, Lord, help us. So God, it's God suddenly and miraculously putting one bit of his knowledge into, one's, into the mind of one of his children. So God who knows everything, we do know that, don't we? God knows everything. We call that omniscient. That means God is all-knowing. There is anything, have you ever met folks that don't make no difference what you're talking about, they know something about it? I, I don't care if it's flying a jet airplane or running deer dogs through the woods. It don't make no difference. From A to Z, they know something about it. Or you see what I'm saying? God truly is all knowledge. He knows everything. 
Now, he knows why some folks have passed with COVID. Some of our friends have, and others have survived. We don't, but we don't know what he knows. You see what I, That's what makes him God and us the creature rather than the creator. You see what I'm saying? And so we're just thankful for what God does for us and thankful for the knowledge that he gives us. Would you say a good amen to that? So you suddenly just know something by the Holy Ghost for which you have no natural explanation why you know it at all. I don't know. If, and if it happens to you, if you're like me, you've got to acknowledge God because I'm not that smart. I've said that to you before, Heather. Isn't that the way it is? I mean, whenever it just happens, when it happens to me, and it has happened to me, I'm just saying, oh, Lord. I, I mean, I'm just... My knees, Brother Doug, just gets weak because I know it's God because I'm not that smart. I, I, just, I just know that. And most of the time, it's not something long and elaborate or something super spiritual. It's something simple and some simplistic. And I'm thinking, why didn't I know that? Why didn't I have that understanding? You see what I'm saying? And yet it's God holding that information from us until... It, he wills it to happen, and then all of a sudden, just bang, man, it's as clear as if somebody flipped the light switch on. Brother Son was a little later tonight coming in the sanctuary than he normally is, and when I come out of my office, I come through that door over there, and all the lights were out. Now, earlier today, these lights were on up here. I thought they would be on. I was going to come in here and lay my Bible down here on the altar. Well, I did that after I stumbled over that altar, and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I, when I hit my shin on that altar, I said, oh, Lord, I knew I was going to find it. Huh? And then I staggered around over here, and I finally found my way out the door, and I thought, Lord, thank you that I didn't kill myself between A and Z. Uh, now, it's not the ability, ladies and gentlemen, to speak facts. It is just miraculously knowing something. If it's something that you know about, then it's not... It's not a word of knowledge, is it? Okay, if, if it's something that you have a natural ability to do. It, and uh, Now, when you suddenly know something uh, by the Holy Spirit uh, for which you have no natural explanation why or how you should know it, and it always is going to come in agreement with the Bible. I've said this to you at, at every turn, hadn't I? If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, no need to get bent out of shape about it, but ain't no, you know, just take it with a grain of salt and go on about your business. Because people have a zeal, a lot of times Paul said, that they don't have knowledge for. What's he talking about? They mean well, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they're doing. And I don't, I don't mean that. Everybody, I'm, we're not stupid, but all of us are ignorant about some things. Remember what the first thing Paul said about the gifts? I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning spiritual gifts. Huh? Chapter, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, 11, 11, 12, and 13 is what, we, what I've been preaching to you all about. I got sidetracked and I lost my mind. I lost my train of thought. My mind too, brother. Brother Kenny told me tonight, he said, what's wrong, Pastor? He said, you look like you got something on your mind. I've said, I do. And it's such a small area up there that when I get more than one thing on my mind, I get confused. So now you know. Now, it, it's, it's not a several other things. It's not suspicion. Okay? It's not suspicion. It's not worrying. Okay? It's, it's not knowledge of human character or natural knowledge. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's something that got loose in the church some years ago in South Louisiana. I don't know what the stage of it is now. But they got into this, um, all oh, this characteristic study. And, and if you were born in February between a certain, certain time, your sign was, mine's Pisces. Now, what does that mean, Brother Pack? It don't mean nothing. It don't mean nothing, okay? I don't have a clue other than what my sign is, what it's all about. I don't live my life by the signs. I don't read the newspaper every day to see what my, my fortune's going to be by the signs. 
I don't do any of that. Or you understand, it don't mean anything. The Bible tells us not to do those things, so I don't do those things. But the church got involved in trying to figure out what people's characteristics were, trying to figure out what their gifts were to the body. You understand what I'm saying? And so to me, it was a very dangerous thing, and I always steered away from that kind of thing because if God's not big enough to run his church, then we're just messing around anyway. I mean, that's how I feel about it. I, I truly feel that way. I love being here, and I love being called the pastor at Lake Hamilton Assembly of God Church in Hot Springs, Arkansas. But this is not my church. This is not your church. Some of you have been here forever and a day. But the reality of it is it's God's church, isn't it? And if God can't direct us to lead his church, then we're all just playing church. And I'm tired of that, aren't you? I want him to be Lord. Somebody say amen. I want him to be Lord. So I don't care about worrying, no suspicion. God knows I've got to get this, get this thing under control. It's not ESP. It's not psychology. It's not guessing. Oh, I hope I got that right. It's not having a great intelligence or even a great Bible knowledge. It has nothing to do with that. Again, it is a supernatural gift of God that you don't have any natural reason to know why you know what's just been revealed to you, but it just you just know it. You just know it. It's not human insight or knowing everything that God knows because God said, I'll give you a fraction of what I know about that given subject. He doesn't ever tell us all about any given subject. That's the reason every time we study the Word of God, it speaks something new to us. Isn't that awesome? Brother Doug, they couldn't even handle just obeying the one command. Stay away from that tree. Have everything else you can have, but they couldn't do that because the enemy came, and as Sister Alicia said, he lied to them and said, God's lied to you because he knows if you eat that, you're going to be like him, like a God. In other words, he knew that's what he wanted. See, that's what Satan knew. That's, he, that's what he's been after all these eons of years just so that he could be God That's and, and set up there on the throne and got him in trouble. Amen. Amen. And right now in these end of days, he's still working it out toward the Antichrist and the Antichrist rule and reign because that's his man. You see what I'm saying? So we're jumping off subject here real quick and I don't want to vary too far, but you, you see that's a, that's a perfect point. Uh, and, and we see it on a lesser scale to Sister Alicia's point than what uh, people even realize. But if I, if I begin to do that and begin to act that way, then I'm no different than what the snake was or the serpent was or the enemy was whenever I began to assume that because God has gifted me with this gift that he's going to give me all the knowledge that I need about that given subject or that given person or whatever. It just, it just doesn't happen that way. Have you ever noticed how afraid we are if we know somebody's coming that has a gift of word of knowledge or a gift of prophecy? Lord, I don't want them looking at me. You know, why? Because we're afraid that God's going to say something to them. But I'm going to tell you something. I want you all to hear me, and I want you to receive this because I believe this is the honest truth. God will never reveal something to somebody else that's going to embarrass or humiliate you. That's the reason if God deals with me to talk to somebody in the altar, I don't stand there and talk in the microphone. You watch me, I'll leave the microphone behind me or I'll let, pull it back behind me. I'm going to speak into that person's ear because I, that is for them. You see what I'm saying? That's how much God loves us. He's not going to embarrass. He's not going to humiliate us. He's not going to play with our emotions. Sister Bates, you want to say something?
you done what you were supposed to do. Yeah. I believe it's a word of knowledge. It was a word of knowledge. Discernment is, uh, we're going to talk about this at a later time, but it's discernment of spirit. So that's how you tell the difference, sister. Yeah, discernment is, is not discerning knowledge. It's discerning spirits, what spirit it is of. And we'll talk about that later. But, yeah, that's the difference between it. But that's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing. Now, if you were to come to me and were to say something like that to me, I would not just rush right out and confront these individuals, but I would begin to watch those individuals, and I would ask you, would you pray with me about this and let us watch these people that are being influenced and, and begin to pray that God will give me wisdom as the pastor because I'm going to tell you, he's not going to give you the answer to that kind of a problem in that body. He's not going to do it. He's going he gonna to deal with that shepherd. He's not, he's not, he's not going to... He don't have but one head underling in that, in that congregation. That's the pastor. And so he works with the board. He keeps the board. And I'll, I would let the board know what was going on and ask them to help me pray, but to keep it to themselves, that type of thing. But just to go, I would pray about it. I would take things because that's, you know, the, the capability there. If they've got that kind of influence over them where they're coming over there and willfully giving money to them that belongs to the local church, uh, that's a powerful influence. And more than anything, they don't need a rebuke from me. They need God to open their eyes. Because if God opens their eyes, they're going to come back around and everything's going to be okay. So they come, you just got to have wisdom. I want to tell you all something. I pray for wisdom, and I have since I was called to preach. And I'm not talking about the, uh, the, the uh, uh, wisdom here uh, that's in the gifts. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about a word of wisdom. I'm talking about wisdom. I'm talking about just the ability to be able to handle people wherever they are. And uh, not everybody has that. Not every pastor has that. Okay? And I found out a long time ago, gray hair don't necessarily make one wise. Okay? And uh, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was I sent a young couple in my church that I was involved with that was members of my family in particular to go and talk to some counselors at another church that the first thing out of their mouth was they told them they need to split up and go their separate ways. First and last time I ever done that. If they're going to sit on my pews, I don't care if it's my kids, my mama, my daddy, my uncle, my aunt, whoever they are, if they're sitting on my pews, they're my congregation. My responsibility, don't send them off somewhere else. I learned that, Brother Doug, the hard way. So um, I, guess we, I guess we need to move on here because we're running out of time. But uh, let's talk a little bit about how to minister on this, uh, on this, this word of knowledge. There are times in, in, in every life of the spirit-filled believer when he just suddenly just knows something. Uh, this is usually outside the normal area of our thinking, outside the normal area of our training, outside the normal area of our life. If someone thinks that they've received a word of knowledge and they find themselves saying, that's just what I thought, there's a good chance that was not a word of knowledge from God. Okay? So if the first thing that you do, that's what I thought, back up and leave that alone. Because it's a good chance that's just what you thought being, being the key word there. Okay? And so it's more than likely it was your imagination. Now, some believe that it reveals the mind of God concerning people, places, or things pertaining to present or sometimes the past, but never about the future. Jimmy Swaggart believes that. A word of knowledge about what's going on. See, Sister Bates's word of knowledge was about what was going on now. A uh, word of knowledge about what's happened in the past. word of knowledge about what uh, is taking place right now. Jimmy Swaggart believes that way. This is a miracle of revelation that is over, beyond, and many times contrary to what we might have thought about a given situation. Now, if we think we have a word of knowledge, we should go, some, go to somebody who is used in this gift and relate our experience to that person and let that person help you. 
Y'all do know that the scripture says that the older ones, the, uh, the, the ones that's been living for God, it is our responsibility to teach and train the young folks. So if you're, if you're a young believer and you feel like God has given you a word of knowledge, go to somebody that, ha that you know has been used in that gift and say, tell them your experience. What do you think? Sister Bates just done it just now. You see what I'm saying? That's totally within the confines of what the scriptures teaches us. And as you begin to do that, you begin to realize, hey, this is a real thing. God is wanting to use me. And as a result of that, you become more confident and you don't have to go to somebody else. But Sister Bates, in, in her situation, I think, done exactly what she should have done. Because if Sister Bates, had a, if that had been going on in our church and she just went straight to them and dealt with them and so told them, you, can you imagine? Just let your mind, let your imagination run just a minute. I mean, it'd be a wild thing. So I'd be having to deal with the situation because the can of worms had been opened up, and I have to deal with this Sister Bates about opening the can of worms. You see what I'm saying? That's not a threat, ladies and gentlemen. That's just the way church works. Okay, are y'all with me? Let me give you a couple of illustrations. A man came to an evangelist one time during the meeting and told him how that he had been impressed that three of his friends living in different towns were sick and needed healing. He asked the evangelist what he should do. He had no natural reason to think that they were sick. The evangelist told him to drive over and visit one of the friends and ask if he had been or was now sick. If the man answered in the affirmative, then he would know that it was there by the Lord and God had impressed him with it. But he said if he revealed to him that he had not been sick, uh, then it would just be something in his imagination. So, but if he revealed to him that he was sick or had been sick, then he could expect the gift of faith to pray for that sickness and God bring healing to them. Not just to the one that he visited, but to all three of those that he was given the revelation about, okay? Uh, when I was preaching in Georgetown many years ago, that was before I started pastoring, it was a little church up there on the White River. I'm talking about out of Searcy, right down on the White River at the jumping off spot. <clears throat> they wanted us really bad to be their pastors. And I'm not saying that for a pat on the back. They were desperate for anybody. I know that, Brother Bates. And, uh, but they liked us, and, and we liked them. I was sitting in the service one night, and just all of a sudden waiting during the process of trying out, God, God revealed to me that somebody in that church had a digestive problem. There's something going on with our digestive system. I was scared to death. Totally, absolutely just came on me out of nowhere. I was scared to death. I thought, oh, God, if this is you, there's fixing to be a miracle. But if this ain't you, I'm fixing to make a big flop right here. Long story short, when I took the pulpit, I told him, I said, because it was still on me and on me heavy. I just told him what I felt impressed uh, throughout the whole service. And I said, now, if you're here and the Holy, Holy Ghost is talking to you about this problem and you have this problem and you know it, if you'll come forth, God's going to heal you. And I said it was just that confident. This lady got up from the back of the church and came up that night. And God touched her and healed her, and she was totally healed from that moment forward. That's how the gifts operate within the body. Would you say amen? amen. Now, let's, let's look at the name here just for a moment because let's go all the way back to what we said the first night. The spirit the, is always subject, the gift is always subject to the prophet, to the user. So, I, I, you know, I mean, if I'm sitting there and my name is Sister Bates and this is going on, I'm going to be as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs, okay? Because I'm sitting there thinking, I'm not going to overrun that pastor. I know that's not God. And yet God is saying, who are you going to serve, me or him? Who are you going to serve? I mean, you're talking about the good Lord putting you between a rock and a hard spot. But you see, when you've done it and done it in the right way, in the right spirit, then he was able to get glory out of it and the thing was done. Okay, you see what I'm saying? And the pastor just... Uh, there you go, Brother Duff. And we don't want to forget that either because all of us are human. Just because I'm the pastor don't mean that I'm not ever going to make a mistake. I made a mistake one time. It's been 20 some odd years ago, but I, 
Uh, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, we're out of time, aren't we? I got five minutes. Let, let me let me give you a couple of let me give you a couple of examples here because uh, this has been a good this has been a great lesson, by the way. A lot of good stuff brought out and 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 things that I might have overlooked, Sister Bates, and to let you know that yes, these gifts will overlap one another many many times, many times in order for them to be successful. They have to, they have to overlap. Okay, because otherwise, some you know somebody's fixing to be played with, and we and that's we just said that, that's not that's not it. The gift of the word of knowledge is not the ability just to speak knowledge or revelation of knowledge. It's not a vocal gift as prophecy or interpretation of tongues. It's a revelation or it's a knowing gift. You know this. You know this something. If a person who has received the word of knowledge speaks out that knowledge, he must do so by his own ability. Tongues, interpretation of tongues is not our ability. It's the ability of the Spirit. You see what I'm saying? So this word of knowledge that you received just that, that night, it would have died right there had you not spoke it out. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's, let's give you some examples of this. In John chapter number 1, verses 47 and 48, Jesus knew there was a word of knowledge. There was a knowing. He knew by a word of knowledge before he ever met him. Knew Nathaniel. I'm talking about Nathaniel. You remember that? He said, before you ever came over here, I saw you when you was what? Sitting under the tree? Was that where it was at? And, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, he kind of took notice of what the Lord is saying. If you turn over the book of Revelations and you read Revelations chapters 2 and 3, God gave John a word of knowledge concerning those seven churches of Asia Minor. John had no knowledge, and it was what was going on right now in those churches in Asia Minor. That's what was going on. God gave him a word of knowledge. Remember where John was at? He was on the island of Patmos. He was there. Why? Because of his faith. He was there as a punishment. John was doomed to die on the Isle of Patmos. They done tried to kill him by boiling him in oil, and that didn't kill him. So the only thing they could do with him is put him out there on this island with all the other crooks and criminals that they abandon out there to make it the best way they could and that's where John was at when the Holy Ghost came on John and gave him this word of knowledge relative to the church that was going on at that time in Asia Minor and I'm like most Bible scholars I, I'm not a scholar I don't mean to say that but most Bible scholars believe this and I also concur with this that not only was it a revelation about what was going on in those seven particular churches in Asia Minor but it was also a divine revelation, word of knowledge about the entire church age. What was going to be going on during the church, during the various ages of the church. And if y'all hadn't figured it out by now, we're in the last one, which is what? Laodicean age, which was the lukewarm age. I won't go no further. So John, in the natural, he had no ability to know this. So the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom works many times together, as do many other gifts that we've been talking about. In Acts chapter 9, there was, uh, uh, we're told that God touched Ananias and told him certain facts about Paul. This was a word of knowledge. Then he gave him additional word of wisdom on the apostle Paul because he said, Paul is going to be a chosen vessel to bear uh, Jesus' name to the Gentiles. So see, he not only had a knowledge about Paul, but he had a, a wisdom about Paul. He had a word of wisdom that was speaking about what was going to be going on with that knowledge. Many years ago, I remember Jimmy Swagger, when they were building their, their church down there, there was a huge expanse. I don't know if you've ever been in Family Worship Center or not, but if you hadn't, it's worth the trip to go down there. It's beautiful beautiful edifice even though it's many years old now but when they were building it the architect had put a huge column right in the center of the church and it was a it was to to bear the load of of that and brother swagger said i don't want no column there and was brother swagger don't know nothing about 
architecture. He don't know nothing about engineering. He don't know anything about none of that. But he knew he didn't want that post to be in the middle of that church or wherever it was. I don't remember now. And he began to pray. And he just began to seek God. He told the architect and the, and the, and the, the crew not to put it there. He said, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to see what God says. He prayed about it for, I don't know, several days, a week, maybe two weeks, something like that. And one day he was walking through there, and just all of a sudden he just had a knowledge. He just had a knowing that you don't have to have that if you do this and you do this and you do this over here and you do this over there. So he goes to the architect and says, I want to ask you a question. He says, yes, sir, Brother Swagger. He said, have you figured out how to do this post without, I mean, do this building without that big beam being there? And the architect said, no, sir, I don't think there is any way. To which Brother Swagger says, well, what about this? And he said, can you do this over here and take a lot of the weight and move it over here and shift the weight off onto the sides? Is there any way that we can do that and be able to have that expanse load-bearing wall and yet without that post, that, that beam being there? He said the architecture had this look on his face. Uh, this architect man had a look on his face said, where did you find that out at? said, I never even thought about that. Long story short, if you go down there now, that beam is not there. Because God had given Brother Swagger a word of knowledge, okay, and then a word of wisdom how to make that knowledge work to when he went to the architect with, they took it and flew with it because it's very sound, architecturally sound. I was told that in their heyday, that church would run about 7, 000, hold about 7,000 people. And they used to have camp meetings in there. And the first one they had, there was over 7,000 people there. And the building was rocking so. The balcony area, you could literally see it moving. And they got scared. And they called the architect out. And the architect come out and looked at everything. He said, don't worry about it. He said, that's what it's designed to do. That's what it's designed to do. So they never worried about it anymore. But, I mean, I'd have been afraid too. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, when God's gifts operate within the body, it's always going to be productive for that body. Would you say amen to that? That's what I'm saying. If you, if you start to look at these gifts, you're going to see them operate throughout the pages of the Bible. That's not what they were called then. But this, I, want, I want you to realize, y'all do know that the Holy Ghost was there from creation on through. He didn't just show up on Pentecost. Y'all do know that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we have a tendency to forget those kinds of things. All right. Uh, we've talked about the purpose of it tonight and all of this. So I'm not even going to go over, over all these things tonight. But uh, just know that whenever the word of knowledge is given, it's going to reveal afflictions in people that may be too, uh, too shy or too timid to come and ask for it, as was in Sister Bates' case. It will show a need in, in another person so a Christian can help them pray. It, it is for us to be benefited by. Go back, back to what we talked about originally. It is for us to be benefited by. God will always do that because why? He loves us. He loves us so much that he knows what our needs are before we ever ask. And he helps to supply the needs of the body through the body, through the body. Amen.